Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this um, press conference with uh, Rick Cates. Let me just tell you quickly how it will go. Uh, we're going to start at 12.30. Rick is going to talk for about um, half an hour. Um, and then we'll have a further period of Q&A. Uh, we'll finish at 1.30 rather than the more habitual 2 o'clock as uh, we don't have a translator. Um, I think you all know Rick. You've all been reading uh, his excellent um, The Oriental Economist. You know that Rick has been a uh, fairly consistent critic of Abenomics. Um, he, uh, he, he's generally acknowledged that the first arrow has, um, has gone towards its target, but he's always said that the first arrow is irrelevant if the other two arrows don't follow suit. He's pointed out that the second arrow of a fiscal uh, spending has been uh, counteracted and more by the tightening caused by the consumption tax. Um, and he's always taken the position that the third arrow, uh, the um, deregulation of uh, the economy has really failed and that Abe has failed to take on um, the vested interests. And his latest report has an excellent piece on the butter situation in Japan. If you're wondering where all the butter's gone, then you can lay it firmly at the doors of uh, Japan Agriculture, the notorious and monopolistic co-op. Um, without further ado, let me uh, give the podium, as it were, to uh, Rick. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay, hi. Um, it's very, very good to be here. Uh, and I thank you for, for the invitation. Uh, as those of you who, who've seen me before and know me, I'm, I'm a bit of a chartaholic and not the reforming kind. Uh, however, today what I'm going to do is throw away the charts and speak from the heart. But I may find myself using a few of them um, and uh, and, and also for the Q&A. But let me start off, first of all, um, because sometimes I'm tagged as being a little negative. And my belief is, in fact, uh, Japan will recover, eventually will recover. The thing about Japan, the tragedy of Japan, is it seems to me that you have, an ex in Japan's main resource is its people. You have a very smart and talented and creative population in general. You have lots of people in the elite, whether they be in business or academia or the bureaucracy, who understand the problems Japan's going through, have some very good ideas about how to fix them, although there's disagreements about exactly what to do. But they're trapped in institutions that have become dysfunctional, many of which had been functional, but they become obsolete. They have not changed with the times. And so that <clears throat> the whole is so much less than the sum of the parts. And that institutional renovation is the way that Japan will get out of its crisis. I think that will occur. I had hoped that the 2009 elections, uh, by having a change in regime, would usher in the era of contested politics. And that was one of the necessary ingredients to, to reform. Not because the DPJ would be so good, but just because the, you need competition in politics as much as you do in, in business. And that did not come to fruition. But I still believe Japan will reform. It's going to take longer than I previously had hoped. But that requires leadership, requires leadership with guts, with vision. And I'm sorry to say that that is not Shinzo Abe. We've seen what reform looks like in Japan. If you saw Japan clean up the non-performing, the seemingly intractable, intractable non-performing loan problem under Koizumi and Takanaka. We've seen reform in areas like retail, like telecommunications. So we know what reform looks like. And we don't see anything from Abe that looks at all like that. And that's sort of been my view from the, almost, almost from the get-go, I guess about two, minutes, two months of benefit of the doubt. Um, <clears throat> and 
what I wanted to actually title call appraising economics, I, I really wanted to call it um, fixing Abenomics, because how would one fix it? And basically, the way one would fix it, in my view, is to actually have Abenomics be what it pretends to be. The three, you know, these Abe people are fantastic at marketing. Abenomics, that's great. Three arrows, that's great. Womanomics, that's, they got lots of great names, right? But the three arrows are really things that economists have been saying for a very, very long time needs to be done. And the original concept of the three arrows was to be monetary stimulus, fiscal stimulus, and structural reform, which goes far, far, far beyond just deregulation. And I'll give you some ideas of some of the things that I should, I think should be done. But <clears throat> what happens is you've, got, you've only got one arrow, which is the monetary stimulus. The second arrow is now, instead of being called fiscal stimulus, it's being called flexible fiscal policy. And if anybody can tell me what that means, come talk to me afterwards, because I haven't the foggiest. But what it seems to be in practice is that the arrow has become a dart, and the dart is flying in the wrong direction toward fiscal austerity. That there is one foot on the accelerator and a much, much heavier foot on the brake. And the thing about economic policy is that it's necessary not simply to do the right things, but you have to do the right things in the right order. Doing the right things in the wrong order can be a recipe for disaster. So in the case of Japan, what you need is recovery first and then fiscal consolidation. To try to do fiscal austerity, fiscal consolidation first, is a really a recipe for disaster. It's asking for trouble. And the third arrow, structural reform, has really been sort of, um, to be a bit cynical about it, it's been a violation of the truth and advertising laws. It's, it's a lot of good, nice, very, very nice sounding goals, a lot of numbers, but absolutely no way to achieve those numbers. And the problem is that none of the three arrows work without the other two. So even if we were to say that the Bank of Japan is doing everything it ought to do, in the absence of fiscal stimulus and structural reform, it's, it's impotent. Right? And so let me go a bit through these three arrows, what they look like, and a bit about what I think ought to be done. What would look like progress? What's our, what's our yardstick? On the monetary stimulus, there's this idea from the people who actually created Abenomics that Japan's main problem is lack of confidence, which is both reflected in deflation and caused by deflation that basically people are pessimistic and so they don't spend and companies don't hire and they don't invest and they don't raise wages. So if you could only get people to be more confident, then they'd go out and spend and companies would hire and they would raise wages and we'd have wonderful rejuvenation of Japan. Now, so that Japan doesn't really suffer an economic problem, what it suffers is a psychological problem. And Abe said, is, this in so many words uh, in the diet. And so one of the things the Abe team has done is to keep, keep, keep making promises they cannot keep. So for example, in January, January of 2014, Abe wrote something in Project Syndicate about the coming wage surprise, that wages would rise so much in Japan that they would not only offset the inflation, they would more than offset the consumption tax. And he said, of this I am certain. Well, unfortunately, the track record has been that when Abe is, says he's certain something is going to happen, it's probably not going to. And in fact, the real wages have declined. They've been declining for the last decade or more, and they have declined at an even faster rate under Abe. Right? The guy uses the word bold more than I think the last 12 prime ministers put together. Every time he says bold, you know that means he's not going to do anything. Right? So there's this idea that, in fact, if there were inflation, this is the economic theory behind the first arrow. First of all, if there were inflation, people would go out and spend more because they want to spend now before the prices rise. And companies would be willing to pay, they would demand higher wages, and companies would be willing to pay higher wages. And so you'd have all this spending in this virtuous cycle. 
Now, in fact, 20 years of data from the cabinet office show this is simply not true. That you look at people's expectations for prices over the coming 12 months, and you look at their spending. And expectations of a higher rate of deflate, of lower rate of deflation, there's less deflation, or of actual inflation, do not lead people to spend more, as Kuroda claims, but to spend less. That where people really gauge their spending by is not their expectations for prices, but their expectations for income. If they think, what happens is when they think prices are going to go up, they do not expect their income will go up as much. And they're right. That's been the case since the year 2000. And so they're going to have a fall in real income. And as a result, if you have less money to spend, you're going to spend less. It's not that people are refusing to spend. In fact, the savings rate, which was about 11 or 12 percent in 1997, was negative in 2014. It's not that people are penny pinching or won't loosen their purse strings or all the other phrases that the finance ministry puts out. It's that they've got less money to spend. And Abe took away even more of their money by hiking the consumption tax. And I'm very happy that he's delayed the second hike. But you have to ask, it wasn't that big a hike in the consumption tax. Why did a relatively small hike in tax cause this two-quarter recession? It shows the economy is a lot more fragile than he had been promised by the Bank of Japan and the Ministry of Finance, because in a healthy economy would not have had that impact. And Kuroda's theory is sort of like, um, you know, if you expect inflation, it will occur, because it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. He's like a car mechanic, and you bring your car in, and it won't run, and Kuroda says, well, gee, you know, um, cars need gasoline to run. So I'm going to give you 30 gallons of gasoline, even though your gas tank has only got 15 gallons, and it'll run. And you say, uh, but, but Mr. Kuroda, the engine's also broken. He says, oh, OK, I'm going to give you 50 gallons of gasoline. <laughs> yeah, but the engine's still broken. OK, 100 gallons. And then it won't run. He says, well, the problem is you don't have enough acceleration expectations. I'm going to get you to expect acceleration by promising that the car will run. I mean, it's a very, very silly theory that's being tried out and failing. But the, the only cause of the inflation, the IMF did a study on this, has really been the weakening of the yen. Now, the weakening of the yen has costs and benefits. The benefit is supposed to be that you export more. But in fact, if you look at the number of cars, tons of steel, machine tools, whatever, there's been very, very little increase in the actual volume of exports to Japan. On the other hand, people in Japan have had to pay more money for energy, for food, for smartphones, whatever. So it's a transfer of income from the pockets of Japanese to the Arab oil sheiks or Korean and American smartphone makers or whatever. Right? So that has hurt real wages. And of course, therefore, consumer spending is very anemic. So that's your first arrow. I mean, it's based upon a, a false theory. And Naturally, it has not worked. Uh, the only advantage is for the rest of the world, Japan is performing an experiment, and so people can now judge whether this theory, which is very popular in academia, uh, makes any sense whatsoever. And it, it does not. I think the evidence shows that. The second arrow has become fiscal austerity. Now, Abe, to his credit, is not doing what Hashimoto did back in 1997. He's not cutting spending to the bone. He's sort of keeping it even, maybe raising it a bit. But he did raise these taxes, and, and he's postponed the second tax hike. I would have preferred that instead of saying it's postponed for 18 months, he'd said it's postponed until we get a solid sign of recovery. For example, deflation really is overcome on a sustained basis. Even more important, real wages do increase on a sustained basis. Then we're going to raise taxes. But that's not what he's doing, done. Now, what Abe has been told, and Khan was told the same thing, the propaganda coming out of the Ministry of Finance and the Bank of Japan has been several. If we don't do the tax hikes, then the international markets will lose confidence in us, and the stock market will crash, and interest rates will go to the sky. 
Now, in reality, the opposite occurred. When, when Abe announced the delay, the ch stock market soared. And, and what, I don't know, what is the 10-year bond today? I mean, I think you go back seven centuries, it's hard to find any country except perhaps for Switzerland in the last few months, where, you know, the, I mean, going all the way back to Venice and whoever, where interest rates have been this low. The Bank of Japan has proved it can really push interest rates to the floor. So this fairy story, about, or scare story, to, to politicians, you better raise taxes or disaster is about to strike. I mean, why anybody would still believe the finance ministry or the Bank of Japan about this, I don't know. And luckily, Abe had some advisors like um, Honda and, and Hamada who really you know, set him straight on, on that particular point. But the other idea was that Japan would become the next Greek tragedy. That at some point, and we've been hearing this for 20 years, that at some point there is so much debt in Japan that we're going to have a crash. All right? Well, here's a case where, in fact, I will use a chart because this is really, really snazzy. By the way, this is real wages since 2006, and look how the decline of real wages accelerate under Abe, despite his guarantee that they would increase. Now, okay, so why Japan is not Greece? So we've got, the, from the horizontal line, is the total amount of government debt relative to GDP. This was in 2010 when the crisis hit, right? The vertical line is how much money you owe to foreigners. So every single crisis country in Europe was in the lower right-hand box, and that meant they had two forms of debt. They had really, really big internal debt of government debt, but they also had very, very large debt to the foreigners. So the foreigners took out their money when they got scared. There was capital flight, which caused interest rates to spike, and then you couldn't afford to buy the oil or the spare parts, and the economy tanked. Right? But if you look at the top right-hand box, these, com these countries have a lot, a lot of government debt, but they don't owe foreigners money. Foreigners owe, owe them money. So, for example, Belgium's de government debt is just as large as Portugal, about halfway between Portugal and Greece. Is anybody talking about the Belgian crisis? Germany has got debt as bigger than Spain, as big as Ireland. Is anybody worried about the German debt crisis? It's because Germany's a net creditor. Now, Japan, you see, is way on the top of the right-hand corner. Tons and tons of internal debt. But it also owns, owe, owns, is owed more by the foreigners, right, than it owes to the foreigners. It's not in danger of capital flight. It can keep financing its own debt. The Bank of Japan can keep buying Japan government bonds and keep the interest rates down. This does not mean that Japan can go on forever. But it does mean is that Japan has got a cushion of many, many years to afford to say, let's spend money on the right things, the right kind of fiscal policy, including tax cuts and the right kind of spending, to get the recovery going, and then we move to fiscal consolidation. So don't do fiscal austerity now when the economy is fragile. Wait until you recover. I mean, it seems to me pretty commonsensical, but that's just me. So now let's talk about the third arrow. So third arrow really means structural reform. And as I say, it goes way, way beyond uh, deregulation. What, what have we got time-wise here? Uh, another 12 minutes. OK, great. OK, here we go. All right. So let's look at some example. First of all, I cannot find, and if anybody can find this, tell me. But I don't know of a single case where Abe has really challenged a powerful domestic interest group in the interest of economic reform. I don't think his heart beats to the rhythm of reform and rejuvenation. I think his heart beats to the rhythm of what his grandfather did or did not do 70 years ago. Uh, having the foreign ministry say no, the army did not make sex slaves of women, it was middlemen. It wasn't really 200,000 people who were killed in Nanjing, it was, it was only 40,000. And the collective self-defense, which I think in a dangerous world, collective self-defense makes sense, but it's tarnished by being associated with these other ideas. 
And I think the only people who benefit from Abe coupling the notion of collective self-defense with this revisionism about World War II are the Chinese, because it hurts Japan's credibility. In fact, one wonders, not seriously, but one wonders, do Xi Jinping and Abe have conversations that night where Xi Jinping says to Abe, why don't you say something crazy because it's going to help my popularity here at home? And Abe says, okay, but why don't you take another island from the Philippines because it'll help me, you know, win over people to collective self-defense. Now, I don't believe in serious conspiracy theories, so I'm not seriously proposing that is the case. But when I talked to people in China and told them that joke, they did laugh. So, for what that's worth. <clears throat> so let's take an example of what would a serious structural reform look like. Well, in one sense, structural reform is not one arrow. It's a thousand feathers. And there's lots of small, arcane, really, really boring things you have to do in a lot of sectors, which together add up to a critical mass and create a big change in the economy. But you also have to do a few big things. One, because they actually move the economy. And two, because by having an impact, they create the political capital and the political support that allows you to do the other things you want to do. So what would be an example that is within the government's power to do? Well, one of the biggest problems in Japan is the rise of irregular workers, right? Which I think are now about, what? Let me see if I got it here. Oh, first, well. No, it's, I forget about it. OK. Um, so the rise of irregular workers. Both women, I think it's about 57% of all women now have these irregular jobs where they're paid one third to one half per hour, which wasn't the case 20, 25 years ago. Among men, it's something like 18%. If you take men in their, in their 30s, among men in their 30s with regular jobs, 75% are married. You take men in their 30s with irregular jobs, only 25% are married. You want people to have more babies? Stop lecturing on women on how they're supposed to be birth machines and start paying men and women real wages that allow them to support a family. That would be a nice thing to do. And would it increase purchasing power? It would address a lot of things. Now, in Holland, they have a law, which is equal pay for equal work. So yes, companies need flexibility. And what Abe is calling labor reform is no reform at all. What he's saying, and I don't think he's going to do it because it's too politically tough, but what Kedonrin is asking for, what Abe is talking about doing, is saying, we're going to give companies the power to make mass layoffs. Now, it's true that companies need the power to reduce their payrolls in down times. But if you don't have a system for reabsorbing those people, then what's that going to do to the economy? To the, oh, it's going to create just more irregular work, more low-paid workers. It'll boost company profits, but will it cause growth? I don't think so. So what I would do is to say, I would, yeah, make it easier for companies to lay off people in downtimes, but also I would say equal pay for equal work. Now, this the government can do by a law. It's not administratively difficult. If two people are standing side by side or sitting side by side doing exactly the same job, they should be paid the same wage. They should not be paid a third less or a half hour or half less because they're called irregulars. So end that distinction. So companies might want to hire more irregulars to gain flexibility, but not to cut wages. And every time wages are cut, that cuts purchasing power. So to each company, each company feels, if I cut my wages, I'm saving money. But when I cut the wages of my employees, I'm cutting the sales of some other company. I mean, common sense, right? I mean, is that so hard to get? So you want to raise wages. And the raise, way to raise wages is not by Abe lecturing companies on that they should raise wages. This is not why companies raise wages. They do so either because of economic conditions or the power of unions, which doesn't exist anymore, or in this case, a regulation that says equal pay for equal work, right? Now, that alone is not enough. 
one of the problems in Japan is that it's very hard for people to switch from company to company. And there's a lot of pressure on to save mediocre companies. In fact, the labor ministry gives subsidies to companies to keep on workers they don't really need, right? Because in Japan, the, the government provided social safety net is so thin that the actual real social safety net of most people is their current job at their current company. If their current company fails or downsizes, what happens to those people in a rigid labor market? So what you need is a solid social safety net that helps people transition from job to job. Now, some of that involves unemployment compensation. But you know, in Europe, they make a distinction between passive labor measures and active labor measures. So passive labor measures are things like unemployment compensation. Active labor measures <clears throat> are basically where you're saying adults are constantly in adult education, retraining programs, the government spends money to link up workers who need jobs with companies who need workers. They gear their training to what kind of jobs are in demand. There's a constant education, so you don't have this problem of, of people being unsuitable for the new job. One of the strengths of Japan, compared to America, for example, is that, is that on certain basic types of things, the Japanese educational system for most people is much better than in the US. At the elite level, no. But in terms of basic level, yeah which means that people are more capable of absorbing new tools, more ideas. You don't have this huge underclass that you have in the US. So that's an advantage Japan has that it's not taking advantage of. And so countries like Holland or Sweden or Denmark and I spend about one or 2% of GDP every year on these active labor measures. Companies right now, they spend a lot of money on training their regular workers, improving human capital. They don't spend money on training their irregular workers because they expect them not to be there. Again, this needs to be addressed. Now, we're told by the finance ministry, well, we haven't got the money to retrain people because, after all, we have to cut our budgets and pave over riverbeds. But, in fact, this is, not, this is an investment in Japan. So if you put those things together, you know, and, and by the way, it's very nice on womanomics for Abe to talk about, um, you know, appointing five women to his cabinet, or a certain number of women should be on the board of directors. Now, I met this woman last week before I came here. She's uh, on the board of about 10 different companies. So I can imagine the top 1,000 companies each having a woman on their board, and it's probably like the same 10 women serving on, you know, lots of boards. But what about maternity harassment, right? I mean, if you want, women want both career and family, and they're not given that choice. Where is Abe moving against maternity harassment? There's a court suit about it. Now, in America, they have a system called friend of the court. I don't know if you have that system in Japan where the, the government can actually say, here's our opinion. But there's things you could do regulation-wise, step up enforcement about maternity harassment. These are things Abe would be doing. So if you put those together, equal pay for equal work, an active uh, labor market system, maternity harassment, this sort of thing, you would then have a situation where, in fact, you would raise real wages, you would enable people to move from firm to firm, you have more fluidity in the, in the market. Companies could hire the workers they need without fear that, that, that they'll still have to pay them when they don't no longer need them. And it would have an impact on the economy, and people could see that impact, and then they'd be willing to give Abe the benefit of the doubt to do other things, which will take longer to have an impact, which are more complicated, which are more difficult. And Deng Xiaoping did a similar thing in China, by the way, starting off with sort of rural reform. So there's a politics to it, which is way above my, my pay grade. So I can just talk about the economics of it. But it's one thing you do. Now, I have what? Two minutes. Two minutes. Oh, there you go. OK. so. Two other things. One is energy. You can't grow without energy. So Abe has occasionally talked about nuclear power, but he stayed away from the issue because it's politically radioactive. But what has he done? People don't trust the nuclear utilities because they're not trustworthy. What has he done to actually make these companies more trustworthy? And no matter how cheap the yen is, 
If, if companies don't know they're going to have electricity, why would you build a factory here or a mall here? And the third thing has to do with the corporate side, which is, look, Sony is a very sad story for those of us to whom it was a heroic firm. We would not have had Elvis without Sony's transistor radio. And we would not have had the transistor radio without the killer app that was, that was Elvis, right? <laughs> but look at all the new products of, of Walkman and, and, and VCRs and lasers and then super tankers from other companies. And Japanese companies produce a horde of new products. But it is very hard for any company to be superb for decade after decade after decade. At some point, it just becomes merely good. And in a fast-moving world of electronics, merely good is not good enough. Where is the Sony tablet that people want to buy? Where is the Sony smartphone that people want to buy? Sony's problem is not the, the weak yen or the strong yen or whatever the yen. Sony's problem is smart people who are inventing smartphones or the lack of such. Right? So the difference between the US and Japan on this front is that if you look at the top 21 hardware manufacturers in electronics, a third of them did not even exist in 1970. Twelve years ago, half of them, I'm sorry, half of them did not exist in 1970. And a third of them, only 12 years ago, were so small they were not even members of the Fortune 500. And now they're on top. In Japan, the last new entrants among Japan's top two dozen hardware electronics manufacturers 70 years ago, 1946, Sony and Casio. So when those companies fall down or just become merely good, where's the ability to replace them? Where's the ability of new companies to challenge the incumbents? It's companies that create growth, that create value. You have a, have a system where it's possible for new companies to come in and challenge the incumbents. Japan has got the lowest rate of the birth and death of firms among the entire OECD countries. And it's the birth and death of firms, which is kind of the Darwinian equivalent of natural selection in the economy. Schumpeter called it creative destruction. But that gets back to the first point. If you don't have a good social safety net and the destruction is too destructive to the people, then it becomes politically intolerable and you don't get the creation either. What you get is malaise. When we see Shinzo Abe tackling these problems, then we can really rejoice and say, yes, Japan is on its way to rebirth. Until we see that, then it's just numbers and promises that are empty. All right, on that note, let me stop. And I, question, I welcome not only questions, but comments, disagreements, diatribes. What, I'm not sure that was okay with no, your rules. Yeah, yeah, no, that's excellent. Um, let me, uh, while people are digesting that uh, excellent uh, overview of, the, of Abenomics, and I think you're, you, are, you are maintaining your stance of uh, criticizing many aspects of Abenomics uh, structurally. Um, one thing that I, I wonder is whether your timing isn't a little bit off. So I totally agree with you with everything, but now we're getting this incredible bonanza from cheap oil. Um, we're getting exports finally picking up. We're getting uh, forecasts that the, the, the current quarter will be, will be slightly positive. Do you think that actually this is an inflection point, that this is the darkest point before dawn and that things will actually, um, the abenomics will finally pay off over the next, uh, over, over 2015? No. Oh, you want some elaboration <laughs> on that? <laughs> if possible. <laughs> Markets go up, markets go down. Economies go up, economies go down. Oil prices go up, oil prices go down. Nobody knows what oil prices will be. First of all, no one knew they would be $50 today. Is that what they are today? Less under $40. I, haven't, I mean, I haven't looked $44. at it. $44. 44 there you go. Bada bing. OK, so you know, I don't know where they're going to be in two months. I don't know where they're going to be in two years. I don't know where the yen's going to be in two years. So yeah, as long as it happens, it helps the Japanese economy. But if the only thing keeping the Japanese economy going is loyal, low oil prices, that's a problem. Yeah, exports are up a bit, but nothing to write home about. The yen is down by 30 percentage points from when it was two years ago. And exports, real exports are up maybe 3 or 4%. So yeah, so you have these cycles. But we've had a trend. Um, 
GDP is lower today than it was before the recession, global recession began and in Japan, January 2008. In this quarter, it'll probably get above it, but not by much. So there's a long-term trend where Japan's average growth since 1992 has been about 0.8%. The potential growth is going down because the number of working age people is going down. The number of hours they work is going down. So unless you have a productivity revolution, which allows each worker to produce more, then it's very, very hard to get a lasting acceleration in growth. And you also have fewer and fewer workers for every retiree, which causes a real problem in, in the budget, to which Abe's answer is, let's cut benefits for old people or raise taxes on younger people. So uh, no, I don't see this as an inflection point. I do think it will be advertised as such, but that doesn't make it true. Okay, thank you very much. Let's start with the working press first. Uh, Mr. Knittel. Please raise your hand if you want to ask a question. <coughs> no, Siegfried Knittel, freelance from Germany. Uh, you talked about um, employment system reform. And uh, I think, uh, uh, of course, uh, the Japanese government can change the system of the divided labor market. But I think there are a lot of things uh, the government itself cannot change. Think, think about this companies uh, employ uh, new stuff every year after, uh, after people uh, uh, graduate from university. Um, it makes company not f flexible because only uh, stuff from one year uh, will be uh, uh, they will uh, be employed in in the, in the spring uh, uh, every year. You cannot. Uh, it's difficult to change later the company P because you you don't fit in the system uh, of uh, of a, a new of the, a new company with a, a job education and you don't fit in the hierarchical system. It's difficult in, in Japan uh, for uh, a new staff to be integrated in a different, if they don't, in, this, in the same age, like uh, the stuff in the company. This is also makes Japanese company very unflexible. And it, um, I think a lot of uh, stagnation and non, what you talked about, so and so, and no, not no products. I think it has to do with, there is no change in the labor market. The people, people cannot go to a company who thinks it is more creative for, for their ideas. It's it's difficult to do in Japan. I think, but I think in this, uh, the government. I think it's difficult for the government to, to change these things. The companies have to do it. Okay, I, I got it. I got it. Uh, yes and no. First of all, there are certain things the government can do, which can certainly encourage and make it easier for companies to do it. Uh, one I said is you know allow irregulars, but equal pay for equal work. What you're having is more and more irregulars. There are also the unemployment, the unemployment compensation, the way it's designed, is the longer you have worked for a company, the higher your benefits are. So that is an incentive for people not to switch companies. The other thing, the, the more, most basic thing to keep in mind, though, is you know, Japan's current labor system is not something handed down by Prince Shitoko in the sixth century. It really isn't, despite what some culture vultures might say. This was a deliberate creation by Japanese people after World War I and after World War II to create, to solve a particular problem, which was a shortage of skilled labor. And companies want to have a way to sort of tie people to the firm, to invest in training them, but knowing they weren't going to leave, seniority wages, all sorts of things. But the fact is, one thing that Japan is very good at is gathering people together in government and out of government and it's a long process of nemawashi, as you're all familiar with. But in fact, you then do come up with a solution. And in one sense, what one could look at the last 20 years as a very, very, very long process of nemawashi, but with no one with any idea of what the other end should look like. And the system was created by Japanese people to solve deliberately to solve particular problems at a particular time. There are different problems now in a society that's aging, where population is declining, where you know, it's not growing as fast. Those problems can be solved, and it is possible to bring people together 
And it's not something that one company can do at a time. It's something that you actually have to get companies are willing to lay people off if other people are willing to do mid-career hires. The ability of a younger person to give instructions to somebody who's older than them. Well, some of these cultural behaviors are things that people have been trained to do. And they can be trained differently. Companies that penalize people more for the mistakes they made then rewarded them when they took a chance, and sometimes the chance succeeded, sometimes it didn't. But reward them for those who take a chance and do succeed. So there's all kinds of practices that are changed. I think Japan, Japanese people are more capable of change than they are often given credit for. They've shown this historically. And so yeah, the government alone cannot do it. But the elite of Japan, part of which is the government, and part of which is business leadership and union leadership, and academic leadership and the bureaucratic leadership can, in fact, create a mindset and create tools and levers to promote that sort of change once people decide that's what we want to do. I think people are afraid of doing that because better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. So it involves a certain leap of faith, but that's where le real leadership comes in, real confidence where it says, yeah, it is a difficult leap, but we need to do it, and we can do it, but in a realistic way, not in this false bravado way we, we've been getting. So I have confidence they can do it. Stefano? <clears throat> Thank you. My name, is, my name is Stefano Carrea from the Italian Economic Daily newspaper, Il Solo 24 Ore. Thank you for your insightful uh, opinions. Um, you said that Abenomics uh, is uh, relying too much on the miracles from monetary policy and is insufficient on the second and third arrows. So I want to ask you, how do you see the situation in Europe and what the lessons from Japan could be uh, for Europe? Because it seems uh, now that the European Central Bank embarked eventually on quantitative easing, situation it seems strangely similar because uh, uh, monetary policy is supposed to be much of the job vis-a-vis -vis with a unnecessary restrictive fiscal policy and the slow pace of reforms in single states. Thank you. Yeah, I want to limit how much I say about Europe because I don't really know enough about it to speak intelligently, but that's never stopped me from having opinions before. So I think Europe was caught under this ideology of so-called expansionary austerity. Was that a David Cameron term? That somehow fiscal austerity was going to produce growth? That because, I don't know, people would have more confidence because the government was getting its budgets in order? I mean... This to me is just sort of equivalent to saying two plus two equals potatoes. I mean, it just makes no sense at all. And I think the European leadership sort of committed suicide by, you know, having fiscal austerity in the midst of recession is a path toward deepening the recession. It is not a path toward survival. And then the idea that printing lots of money is going to cure all the other problems. If only it were if only it were that simple that one could cure all the problems just by printing lots of money. What a wonderful world that would be. But I think that's a, a fairy story. Thank you. Christoph? <clears throat> and then Todd. Süddeutsche Zeitung Germany night out. Thank you very much for your insights. I couldn't agree more. Um, Can you stop there? Everybody says I agree, and then there's always a but. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not, no but, no but. Not at all. <laughs> Just the opposite. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the very low interest rates on the JGB. But. <laughs> Isn't the BOJ totally distorting the market? They are buying 200% of the newly issued JGB by buying more from the market. So they, on certain days, there is no market at all anymore. So uh, they are distorting the market. The, then the, the BOJ is buying uh, uh, ETFs. The, uh, the government pension fund is manipulating the stock market. Don't you think Corona really distorts the whole financial system so that it can become explosive anyway? Corona is definitely distorting the financial system or 
if one is, likes puns, one could say Kuroda is corroding the financial system, but I, I'm not going to say that. Um, but I would not see that as a problem if it were coupled with other things and therefore were only a temporary measure. In other words, if the low interest rates were being used to finance productive tax cuts that allow people to spend more or productive public works. Let me give you an example. There's this view, you know, it's all bridges to nowhere. And there are an awful lot of bridges to nowhere. But there are actual bridges to somewhere, or at least they ought to be. For example, I read uh, uh, in Saitama Prefecture, there's a town called Chichibu, which really was the home of a lot of the small and medium suppliers to Honda. Honda now only produces 17% of its entire global production of cars inside Japan. Now it really produces most of the cars in the markets where it sells. So either these suppliers went outside with Japan, or with Honda, or they just disappeared. So the town has lost a lot of revenue. The younger people in the town don't want to stay there. They're moving to Tokyo. And so the revenue base of Chichibu has gone way, way down. Right? Now, one of the results is that there are sewer pipes in the... Uh, water pipes in Chichibu, and they're leaking so badly, and they haven't had the money to repair them, that about a 30% of the water gets lost between the time it leaves the reservoir and times it gets to your faucet. One would think, rather than paving over yet another riverbed, or building coastal seawalls every place except they where they really were needed, like in Fukushima, one might want to fix these water pipes. Why not? Well, I figured they must have the diet member must be in the wrong party. So I looked it up. Well, sure enough, it's Saitama District 11. <laughs> diet member is Shoji Koizumi, who's not related to the prime minister. He's a different guy. And he's, uh, he's a follower of Hironuma. He's been in and out of the LDP, clearly the wrong guy. In Chiba, there's an awful lot of, look at these houses, an awful lot of septic tanks instead of people being connected to sewage lines. As a result, there's an incredible amount of pollution, and I forget the name of the big lake in Chiba Prefecture, but it's like a horribly, horribly polluted lake. Not to mention all the, uh, the pollution of these trucks having to go clean out the sewage lines. Same thing with the propane gas tanks. You could spend public works connecting these things to sewage lines. I believe in California they've actually banned septic tanks. There's all kinds of stuff you could do which is worthwhile spending that actually raises the potential growth rate of the economy. The DPJ had an idea of saying, high school should be free, as it is in most rich countries. Now, they were just so inept. I mean, it's just, it's sad. But they, the LDP said, this is a waste of money. How is it a waste of money to invest in the education of young people? And the DPJ was incapable of convincing people this was not a waste of money, along with other problems they had. But, but the idea that that there's nothing worthwhile to spend money on, that, that everything should be caused by cutting spending because all spending is wasteful, um, is, is, is a very, very destructive um, idea. So the point I'm making is if the BOJ were keeping interest rates low so the government could borrow at very, very low interest rates and spend on the kinds of things which provide both short-term stimulus to the economy but also improve the productive capacity of the economy over the long term, that would be a very good way to spend money. And the temporary distortions in the market would be temporary and not a problem. But if you're in a situation where you're going to have to keep long-term interest rates near zero for, for God knows how long, then life insurance companies are stopping to issue annuity products which older, older people depend upon to earn some interest income and to live. And what's the result for the budget? It's interesting I have this chart up. 27% of all disposable income for consumers come from transfers of money from the government to the consumers, Social Security or other things, up from 16% in 1994. That's going to keep growing. So the result of refusing to spend money in a wise way is resulting in having to spend money in other ways. So the problem is not that what Kuroda is doing. The problem is what is not being, doing, being done to go along with Kuroda, what Kuroda is doing. That's my view of it. 
Uh, Todd. My, na <clears throat> My name is Crowell. I'm with Nuclear Intelligence Weekly. Uh, the mantra from Prime Minister Abe has been, if the uh, Nuclear Regulatory uh, Authority confirms the safety of the plant, it will go into an operation. The Sendai plants were cleared for safety six months ago. They're still not uh, online. So is it time for Mr. Abe to change his mantra? <clears throat> yeah, no, yes, and not only his mantra, but his actual actions. I mean, the NRA has asked um, the Kyushu company, which operates the Sendai plant, to produce some documents, which I believe are related to seismic safety. And they promised to have these documents in December, so it could open in January. They still have not produced these documents, and Lord knows when they will. So we might, I, I assume Sendai will open sometime this year. There may be two in Fukui that will open sometime this year, but it keeps getting stretched out. But there's a more basic problem, which is that Carnegie Endowment did this fantastic study that, that the Fukushima was really a man-made disaster. It was avoidable. There have been these floods in France in 1999. And as a result of that, the International Atomic Energy Agency and other people made recommendations of you know, global best practice for nuclear power plants, things on the line of waterproofing and other sorts of measures. Right? Now, all kinds of com com uh, companies in all kinds of countries follow those recommendations. Japanese utilities did not. Even though you have Kaizen in all kinds of industries, you don't have it in the nuclear utilities. And the argument was, well, if we make this, since we've already said it's 100% safe, if we make this improvement, that means it really wasn't 100% safe before. Right? I mean, I don't know, do you get that? So to prove it's 100% safe, the TEPCO and other companies, in, in connivance with the regulators at METI, falsified safety records. Pipes that were corroded, they said, were safe. This is something for which people should go to jail. In my opinion, they would be in a prison cell right next to Goldman Sachs, but that's just you know, my opinion. Um, but the fact is, the crisis occurred because TEPCO did not take the steps that had been recommended, that the problems had been foreseen. TEPCO's argument, and the argument of the, court, the prosecutors for not indicting TEPCO, was that these problems were not foreseeable, simply false. Not only were they foreseeable, but they had been foreseen. And according to the Carnegie report, uh, even if you had had that same tsunami, and even if they had not built the seawall higher, as one of TEPCO's engineers recommended, although the plant would have been ruined by all the salt water, you would not have had the meltdown. And therefore, you would not have had this panic, and you would not have had the shutdown of the entire nuclear industry. The people in Japan do not trust the nuclear utilities because there's not a lot about them that one should trust. So the worst enemies of nuclear power, in my view, have been the friends of nuclear power. If you want to bring back energy, then you have to make these nuclear plants safe, which means doing something about how the utilities are run. And by the way, why are the stockholders and bondholders of TEPCO being bailed out? I don't get that either. I mean, if you're going to have government spending money, the taxpayers should be the recipients of TEPCO profits, not the stockholders who invested in a corrupt company. So do I think Abe will? He ought to change both his mantra and his action. Do I think he will? No. Uh, lady next. Yeah. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Kaori Ida with NHK Television. At the very, very outset, you said Japan will eventually recover. But then the next 30 minutes, you're very pessimistic. So I guess my question is, what gives you the optimism that Japan will eventually recover? Thank you. Now, I promised I did not plant that question. <laughs> but see, I get tagged as a pessimist, so I'm always glad to you know, have that optimistic thing. It's the people of Japan. I mean, Japan's greatest resource is its own people. <clears throat> the, the, you know, if you look at some of the, the great companies that emerged after World War II, these were innovative, risk-taking companies that came up with all kinds of ideas. Uh, I love to tell the story about how the Walkman was invented. It was invented because Ota at Sony Liked, to, liked opera, and he also liked to walk around and talk to 
workers. Morita. So you want? Morita. No, more, it was Ota, I think, was wearing the headphones. Oga. 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 Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. So he had it on, and he wanted something where he could walk around where it wouldn't, the sound wouldn't bother other people, right? And he could then take it off when he talked to them. And so they built him this thing. And he said, gee, I like it. If I like it, maybe other people would like it too. And they did it. Now, they hired a certain number of people who, you, every company needs a certain number of weirdos. You have to have your sort of people in the blue suit, but you need certain people who think outside the box. <coughs> Sony has stopped hiring those people. After the legendary founders of some of these companies died, in ways that I don't quite understand, but I'm trying to learn more about. They actually develop promotion systems. In some cases, literally, you would start off with 100 points, and you would have points deducted for every mistake you made, but you didn't get additional points for how you succeeded. And so people, it's not that the Japanese are inherently risk avoiders. It's that they were trained the way to be promoted is not to make a mistake. Whereas in Silicon Valley, uh, the idea is if you haven't gone bankrupt at least twice, you're no damn good because you're not willing to take a risk. Now, you call, can't call that American culture because 40% of the people in Silicon Valley are immigrants from South Asia and East Asia. So it ain't American culture. It's a corporate environment that promotes that. In I forget the exact numbers, but it's something like <clears throat> only 10% of entrepreneurs succeed. But the ones, and 90% fail, and people know these, but 60% of would-be entrepreneurs expect to be part of the 10%. So they're kind of irrational, but yet their excess exuberance creates an entrepreneurial spirit that allows it. But you have a system where if somebody tries to be an entrepreneur in the US and they fail, they can get another job. They're, they're, they, it's not a one roll of the dice society. So you have to have an institutional environment where smart, creative people are able to take a chance, and most of them will fail, and it will be okay to fail, and they'll have a fallback option, but the ones that succeed will push things ahead. Now, if you look, you're just talking to Japanese people, people are really smart. Some of the most radical reformers I know are people <clears throat> um, who are bureaucrats or former bureaucrats. I suspect you, you may personally know one of these people. Right? And, and yet they have to do their job and they fit into their slot and doing things they don't really want to be doing because that's their job. And the same thing is true in academia and the same thing is true in media sometimes and the same thing is true in business world. So what we need is an institutional environment which unleashes this power of the Japanese people. And I think Japan has shown several times that it is capable of remaking itself. And so it does take the right institutions to do that. One of them is politics. I do think that a modern, complex economy needs a democracy that's not a one-party democracy that's contested elections. And Japan is the only rich country that's still a one-party democracy. It's very hard for me to see how the LDP can be the catalyst for reform. So I hope that answers your question. But Thanks, Rick. Uh, 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 Rick has kindly agreed to stay on uh, for an extra five to ten minutes. Uh, we can open the floor to uh, non-members of the working press. Uh, let's just go with Joel first, though, and then I'll come to you. Um, yeah, Joel Lejeune from the French TV, FM TV, and uh, RTL Radio. Um, everywhere I watch uh, the news, I see. Um, a lot of reports on NHK, for example, but also on the channels about the aging society. Um, is there a time bomb here? And uh, what do you think the government is doing? Do you think the government is doing enough for our pension here and for the future of the age society? I think it is a real danger here ahead. Do you agree? I agree. And, and um, in this way, I think Japan is somewhat leading the way in the sense that other countries are going through other rich countries are going through a similar demographic situation, which is unheard of historically for a, a capitalist country to go through this kind of demographic decline. Um, and so it's a real problem to be solved. I think they're just sort of kicking the can down the road. I don't think they have a solution. Ultimately, 
When you get behind the specific financial arrangements and financial mechanisms, what really finances old people is the output of working age people. And if you have, as you had a couple decades ago, six working people for every retiree, it's much easier to support those retirees than when you have only two and a half for every retiree, or two, right? It gets harder and harder. And so you get uh, uh, some of the poorest people in Japan are elderly people who are no longer working, particularly widows, as well as some of the irregular workers or people, you know, kids who are living with their parents because they can't find a job. So you get people in their 60s, they should be enjoying this greatness of life, all the stuff they've been doing, and now they're supporting their parents and their kids. Um, and their only answer is, well, we have to raise, basically we have to raise taxes on those who work. We have to cut benefits for those who are aged. The health problems of older people can become quite expensive, particularly if they don't get out enough and do enough exercise and that sort of thing, and, and rising dementia and all sorts of problems. Um, but ultimately, if you're having fewer workers for each retiree, the only answer is that each worker is able to produce more and more and more, which causes a productivity revolution, right? And then, and then there's more GDP per capita. The other thing is that Japan's system, for ways I'm not going to go into, it basically, you spend an awful lot of capital to produce this. In, words, in Japan, you have to spend $4 of, of growth in the capital stock for each dollar increase in GDP, whereas in the US, it might be $2. The return on capital is very, very low. What that translates into is that investment companies or insurance companies or whoever who is supposed to be providing pension funds, their returns on capital are very, very low. If they had higher returns on capital because capital were being used more efficiently, then they would be able to finance a lot of these pensions. So it, it shows up in budget crises, it shows up in financial things, it shows up in life insurance companies no longer issuing annuities. But behind all of it is what kind of growth are you getting per worker? What kind of return on capital are you getting? How much does GDP grow for each additional yen of capital that you invest in? And until you address that, then the aging problem becomes increasingly difficult with each, with each passing year. An obvious basic answer to that is, is basically to pray. Thanks, Rick. Uh, gentleman here. <clears throat> Um, Makoto Honjo Associate. Um, building up on the earlier question, um, in order to uh, address the aging situation in Japan, I would presume that immigration is one of the solutions, and what is your take on that issue? Although I think Abe is not going to move too much in immigration, personally. Yeah, you know what? Um, I know this is going to sound heretical, but I'm not one of those people who thinks that that immigration has to be at the top of the list of the, of the solutions. You know, you can import people, but you can also import the products that people make in other countries. So for example, Japan, if, well, before I get to that, let me just say this. After watching the stuff in France and Charlie Hebdo, I suspect the Japanese people may be even more reluctant <laughs> to have immigration, right? So that's the politics of it. But look, Japanese people spend 14% of their budget for food. Americans spend 7%. The Brits spend 9%. <coughs> France, where well, they're not as protectionist as Japan, but they're still protectionist, it's about 11%. If Japan were to open itself up to more imports, if you were to improve the efficiency of the food processing industry, which is very, very backward. Now, when I say open to imports, you know, because of the JA monopoly, it's very hard for the efficient dairy farmers of Hokkaido to export milk to Honshu. So I'm hoping if TPP passes, not only will American farmers be able to sell more milk in Honshu, but perhaps even the farmers of Hokkaido will be able to send some milk to Hokkaido, to Honshu. Right now they can't, so you can't get butter for your Christmas cake. But you think if you lower the price of food by importing more food, 
taking some buy off the farmers by taking some of this land and allowing these aging farmers who are part time anyway to sell their land, whether for agribusiness or for non farm uses, how much money they would make that they could live on very, very easily. That would liberate all kinds of, of, of money for purchasing other items. It would, in essence, be creating more land for residences, for shopping malls, for factories, and cheaper land. So it would do all kinds of things that would promote uh, growth. Um, right now, the tax system is such that you, you uh, have a very, very low tax on holding property, which means even if you do nothing with it to improve it, your taxes are very, very low. But if you take a risk and you improve the property, you have a capital gain, the tax rate can be very, very high. There's all kinds of land which is called farmland in the urban areas, which isn't really farmland, that people get tax breaks on. Again, there are things you could do that would improve the productivity of Japan. And as I said, one of them is you don't actually have to import the people, but you can import what they make. And Japan has one of the lowest rates of both imports to GDP, but also exports to GDP of any country in the world. And one of the reasons Japan doesn't export more is because it doesn't import enough. And so Japan should really specialize in the things it does well and stop doing the things it does poorly. The country would be richer. And that, I think, would make a much larger contribution to per capita GDP than than immigration. I'm not saying I'm against immigration. I think there's lots of areas in which you could have immigration, and it's something you want to get people used to gradually. But if I was thinking, what are the top things you want to do over the next five or ten years, immigration would not be on, on my top ten list. Thanks very much. Gentlemen there. <clears throat> Uh, Khalil Hassan, Ambassador of Bahrain. I'm very impressed by your uh, presentation. Deregulation, improve economics, inequality. Where's the balance? Name the three again. Deregulation. Right. We talked a lot about deregulation. Okay. Over the last 30, 40 years. Right. It improved the economics, but increased the inequality. Where is the balance? Ah, okay. I get it. I get it. I'm really glad you asked that question. Um, one of the myths that exists around the world is somehow there is this trade-off between efficiency and equality. And it is simply not true. Um, a lot of people who are against reform will say, oh, it was Koizumi's neoliberal reforms that created inequality. The growth in Japanese inequality began long before Koizumi has continued long afterwards. And it's not caused by deregulation. It's caused, well, I mean, the irregular workers are one of the reasons for it. But basically, it's an artifact in Japan of, of the collapse of the bubble in the, in the last two decades. It's a very different phenomenon in the United States. In the United States, we have obscene inequality because one hundredth of one percent of the people get huge, huge amounts of the national income. There are too many obscenely rich. In Japan, you don't really have these obscenely rich. What you have is the poorest 10% being very poor. And they're talking about widows, you're talking about the irregulars, et cetera. There are all kinds of countries that have shown, and, and, and I did a paper called Nordic Mirror, which is sort of, the subtitle was that Scandinavia can reform, why not Japan? And in many ways, Scandinavia was similar to Japan has a communitarian ethic, it has a belief in equality, it had a one-party democracy, those were social democrats as opposed to liberal democrats, but it was one-party democracy. They liked herring, Japan liked sushi, Norwegians liked to kill whales, Japanese liked to kill whales, so there were a lot of similarities, <laughs> right? Now, what they ended up doing was developing a system, besides getting a contested elections and multi-party system, in Sweden, there were groups that came in called themselves moderates, because in Sweden, you really couldn't call yourself conservative, even if you really were. And they tried a Thatcherite program with, in Sweden. And it was a total failure, and they admitted it. So now you have two parties where the socialists are less socialistic, and the moderates are less neoliberal. And basically, they combine market efficiency to produce growth with egalitarian policies that spread the fruits of growth. 
and also with security. So if you lose your job, you know you can get a new job, which means people are very open to technological change. People are very, very open to changing their job. They take care of people who, who are sick, uh, this sort of thing. And think of it this way. It's a kind of a social insurance. Because we have fire, you have fire insurance for your home, you are more willing to take the risk to spend money on building a home because if it burns down, you're going to be OK. And it's not a waste of money even if your house doesn't burn down because you didn't know if you would be the one. There are corn futures which, frankly, make, give less risk to farmers. The risk is transferred to speculators. And as a result, more people will grow more food more cheaply. All right. Well, this kind of matter of egalitarian measures, of, of what in Sweden they call flex security, or of social safety net, is a kind of social insurance that makes people tolerate the measures that are needed to produce the creative destruction that is needed to produce better growth. So in Denmark, for example, you not only had, I think you had at one point the highest wages in Europe, the highest real wages, the highest rate of equality, and very low unemployment. And they had growth. So this idea that there is a trade-off between efficiency and equality, it depends how you run it. You can run it badly, and you do get this trade-off. And in the case of Japan, you've got neither equality nor efficiency. Or you can run it in a way which each reinforces the other, that the growth finances the measures to produce equality. And the equality and the security make people tolerate the market measures that are needed to produce growth so that they reinforce each other. To me, that's the way you ought to run a, a capitalist economy. It's rarer than one might hope, but it certainly is possible, and I think Japan could do it. On that note, um, I'd like to draw the proceedings to a close. Thanks very much, uh, Rick. You were adamant in your criticisms of Abenomics, but you came up with some uh, very powerful um, uh, policies for actually uh, being able, showing how this situation can be changed. Um, so I'd like to uh, once again thank you, and in recognition of your kindness in coming to visit us at the FCC, I'd like to give you a um, one-year honorary membership. And well, thank you. you Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.